a pro-chancellor, acting vice-chancellor, Barry Maguire, members of the academic community of the Western Australian, the University of Western Australia, a koja gailer fault. It all has some hin, I guess, and Madame Sagini Bailey even shown you in Oscar in Australia. Is more an ordam glocko, lesion honor shown doctor on doctoric oinic uifsha a bird. Dear friends, may I first of all, as I speak my own language, acknowledge that it is maybe one thirteenth of the length of a great civilization, and I want to take the opportunity of acknowledging the welcome to country and to, to pay tribute uh, to the original occupants of all Australia, may their elders present and past be honoured. As, 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 as one of the oldest universities in Australia, it, it's always a great pleasure to come back uh, to a university, I have to say, uh, where I spent a great deal of time in universities teaching. But in, the, in this university, the University of Western Australia, here in Perth, has a long and distinguished history. As you have heard, it was established in 1911. But I think this honorary doctorate I receive today comes from a university with a particular distinction in, in reputation and a proud history of academic excellence in contemporary times across so many fields. And I do congratulate the university on reaching, entering the ranks of the top 100 or the academic rankings of world universities. I think it must be a special source of pride, this university, and all of you who support it, that this university was one of the first university in the British Empire to provide free access to tertiary education. And the renown of the University of Western Australia for its ethos of fair access today comes thus from a very distinguished foundation. The importance of offering access to third-level education is a policy principle that I understand. I was the first member of my family to attend a university, and it was a great privilege to have become, been a university teacher, not only the National University of Ireland, but a number of other universities. But that time, when I entered university as an adult, a university education it was not accessible to many. Indeed, in Ireland, a secondary education was a privilege, while further education was viewed as the preserve of the wealthy and the elite. As you have heard uh, of Sir John Winthrop Hackett, this was something he understood so powerfully. And it is interesting that when he comes to Western Australia in 1882, just as the land war ends, and just as the first grants, if you like, of land to tenants in Ireland are taking place, he in fact understood the importance of education. And so many people gathered here this afternoon understand that. In fact, as I look often across the Irish diaspora, one of the recurring features is the emphasis that they placed on the generations of their children that were coming and the value of education. So John Winthrop Hackett, who gave an extraordinary grant to this university and maybe come into existence, was himself a graduate of Trinity College and had come to Australia, as you have heard, in 1875. Thinking of him and his example, and thinking of the words of introduction I hear this afternoon, of course it is important, I think, to stress again, that if we are to craft a society defined by inclusion and justice, characterised by cohesion as well as competence, we must, must work together to make the journey through the educational landscape less arduous, removing all barriers to the achievement of the full possibility and the realization of each individual's true potential. As a graduate of a number of universities, as a graduate uh, of this university now, and as a university teacher, I often think of the distinction in different societies between those societies that offer opportunities for third level education and those who offer perhaps even more frequently, opportunities for going to prison. It is one of the great marks of any civilization, of any country, the degree of access to education that it is offered. 
And I believe myself, thinking about it now back over many years, that we're not served well if such opportunities of education are ever shrunk back to being narrowly defined as simply the enhancement of the value units of labor, education justified as simply and solely a contribution to the efficacy of the labor market. It is more, so much more than that, an emancipation of intellect and of spirit, a great act of being truly human is to be able to listen and to learn and to speak with tolerance and to speak with dis a discourse that is one that is open to the views of others. And entering the doors of a university should always be an experience of encountering the fresh and invigorating air of open pluralist thinking and the encouragement of both imagination as well as tradition. I remember myself the first days of entering a university. And I remember in Galway, where I went, how widely it was appreciated when the walls around the university began to be taken down and the people of the city could walk through the university grounds. The university, this one, has so much to be proud of, has achieved such considerable access in opening the gates of possibility for students from traditionally low participation areas. In my own ancient language, I say, I salute you for that and for the example that it gives, not just here in Australia and Western Australia, but to all universities. And today marks for me and the Irish people I represent as President of Ireland, Maruk Thron Heron, the beginning of a profound connection to this esteemed Institute of Learning, a place where generations of students have achieved not only degrees, as you have said, of great distinction, but also an invaluable, an invaluable understanding of the importance of independent thought and scholarly engagement, the curiosity that must be the center of a university community. Yes, the list of alumni of the University of Western Australia is such an impressive one, and it includes so many who've made a deep and lasting impact in the worlds of politics, public service, arts, science, technology, and economics. I congratulate you too on what is so clear here this afternoon, the connection between your university and its diverse communities. And Sabina and I, Pro-Chancellor, are so delighted that so many from the Irish community have been able to attend the ceremony this afternoon because it is the conferring of an honour on their president. This is the first visit to Australia of Sabina and I, and our first visit obviously to Perth. It was our first port of call, and I thank you sincerely for the warmth of the welcome that we have received. It makes sense to begin our visit, I think, in Perth, because the Irish association with Western Australia runs so deep, extending back as it does to the early days of the Swan River con colony, and the decision of its founders to accept transported convicts into a prison system that was, let us be frank, little m less than a cruel form of slavery by another name. And their emancipation and the arrival of those who came later, like my own grand uncle and my grand aunts and others, came on assisted passages. This led to an increase in the Irish-born population of what was then a growing colony. And if the Irish were about one-fifth of the total of convicts that were transported to Australia, and we also bear in mind the other four-fifths were from the underclass and the poor and those who were the consequences of the clearances in the larger island. Those transported from Ireland, were from where Oxford, many of them were called for political crimes, or as it was described then, as sedition, and they constitute a special category in history. This month marks the 150th anniversary of the departure of the last convict ship, the Hougamont from Plymouth with its 280 convicts and 108 passengers on board. Indeed, it was an honor last Saturday for Sabina and I and those traveling with me to visit Fremantle Prison and hear of the plans to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the arrival of the Hougamont this coming January. And I so wish those organizing that success. Included among those on board were 62 Fenian political prisoners transported for their part in the 1867 Rising. John Boyle O'Reilly, poet and journalist, was their de facto leader. 
And it is one of the extraordinary things of the Fenian movement as to how many of them were journalists and writers, writing of their experiences in Ireland, in Australia, in the United States. And while O'Reilly would subsequently escape the penal colony, he was greatly influenced by his time in Western Australia and continued to write of that experience after he had settled in Boston. I also want to say that those who would eventually escape, those last six who'd escape in the Catalpa, were assisted in their escape by some of the original inhabitants of Australia, for which I'm happy, which I'm happy to acknowledge. John Boyle O'Reilly is still remembered and celebrated in the communities of Western Australia through the admirable work of the John Boyle O'Reilly Association of Bunbury, and I'm grateful to them for fostering this important connection between John Boyle O'Reilly's homeland and the place which was to impact so profoundly on his life and writing. And our Irish in Western Australia are very happy to call themselves Australians and call themselves Australians who are not required to ever forget their Irish heritage. Following the end of the transportation of convicts, the Irish continued to come to Western Australia, many through assisted passages. And then the gold rush years saw the Irish community greatly increase. Indeed, Irish engineer Sewai O'Connor, whom I have referred already, was to be a key figure to the development of Western Australia through his work on the construction of Fremantle Harbour and the Goldfields Water Supply Scheme. I also think as well that it is important that in his proposal for that scheme, he uses the word beneficent, anxious as it were to provide the water not just for the product's extraction, but for the safety and health of the workers who were digging. And then too, to here came in 1895, one of our most distinguished Irish patriots, Michael Davitt, who spent seven months traveling in Australia and New Zealand, and who moved and paid tribute, as I did this morning, to the young parliament of Western Australia. And Irish immigrants were to make a significant contribution to the social needs of Australia, very noticeably through the work of the many Irish religious orders who established themselves here and who left a legacy, nuns, priests and brothers, that can still be seen in schools and hospitals in Western Australia. In recent times, the mining and construction boom has brought many more Irish people to Western Australia. As our own economy contracted, feeling the impact of a property bubble and a bank-induced crisis, which demanded great cost on the Irish public. And as the economy faced a severe contraction, it was to Western Australia again, very many young people, many new highly qualified young Irish men and women and their families sought jobs and new opportunities, and particularly those who were coming from a contracted construction industry. And recognizing that huge increase in the Irish population, the Irish government took the decision to appoint a new honorary consul here in 2013. And may I take this opportunity of thanking Martin Kavanagh and his, party, and his partner Richard for the generous and warm service they unstintingly provide to the Irish community here. It is always a pleasure to be able to acknowledge and sincerely thank representatives of our Irish communities across the globe who do so much to help each other. In that phrase you quoted, it's which God Kayla a warren a thingy. It is in the shadow of each other that people live. They are such valued ambassadors for Ireland. And as president of Ireland, I thank them, those Irish communities who extend a hand of friendship to the new waves of immigrants from Ireland, as they too in their turn begin new chapters in a country that has welcomed and supported so many of our people. Today, I would like to acknowledge and express my deepest appreciation of all of the groups over the years and the individuals who today continue to work to promote and to sustain Irish cultural and community activities here in Perth and across the state of Western Australia. And there are many. The Irish Club in Subieco, whom I met the other day, has long been a home from home for many Irish people who find friendship there and a place to celebrate their culture and heritage. I congratulate the board and all those involved with the club for their hard work and perseverance in ensuring the club continue to be such a, a welcoming place for the Irish community to gather. I thank the CLAD Association, representatives of which I met last evening, which was founded in a spirit of compassion and concern for the plight of those 
in the Irish community here who are facing crisis or difficult times. As we say in Irish, Twenty years later, the association continues to provide support to hundreds of Irish people in Western Australia and their families, and their families at home in Ireland, and keeping contact. The work of the association and its founders is deeply appreciated, and it has impacted so positively on the lives of many of, Irish, of our Irish citizens here and at home. May I mention, too, the Irish families in Perth? who have been such a great source of support, advice, and friendship for so many newly arrived Irish people navigating the challenges of establishing new lives so far away from home. And I thank this university for allowing me to have the opportunity of expressing this gratitude in this wonderful city. And then our Irish culture and heritage, this continues to serve as a connecting point to the, our widely extended Irish family. There have always been more Irish living abroad than at home. Western Australia is no exception, and it is uplifting to hear the vibrant cultural life that lies at the heart of the Irish community here. Indeed, Sabine and I are very much looking forward to seeing the Sense of Ireland concert later this evening. And may I take the opportunity of acknowledging the invaluable work of the Australian Irish Heritage Association, who are co-organisers of the concert, and of the work of those who are contributing to their monthly journal, which continues to explore the Irish legacy in Western Australia. The celebration of so many aspects of our artistic heritage, from theatre, with the Irish theatre players, traditional music, with cults, then dance, with the many schools of Irish dancing that are operating in Western Australia. This is a reassuring reminder that Irish culture continues to be valued and enjoyed here. And most importantly of all, it is shared, and every time it is shared, it is enriched, as cultures are. The reach and inclusivity, and one of the first events, the very first event I attended, was an event associated with the Gaelic Athletic Association, Uncommon Rue Class Gael. But the GAA, as it is called, has extended its stretch far beyond Irish shores, with more than 460 clubs, I think, now abroad. And so many of them are here many of them battling against us, are of such great assistance to our younger men and women who are arrive far from home, many of them battling against a sense of displacement and seeking to create new homes in a new part of the world. And it warms one's heart to know that so many of our diaspora still retain their love of Gaelic sports and find within that enthusiasm an indelible link to home and a means to connect with other members of our diaspora wherever they may be in the world. And Sabine and I were honoured thus to attend the GAA Australasian Championships last Sunday. Western Australia won the hurling at the end. And also to see so many supporters from all across Australia and New Zealand. And I do want to take the opportunity to congratulate Common and Luke Lasquade, Western Australia for delivering these excellent championships. And I know that the hard work involved just really was so appreciated. Chris Liam Lowe, I congratulate them. I'm very, I, of course, they will go on and I think next month organize a very important event under the international rules. And may I say also, there is one day in the year when so many people are happy to celebrate their Irishness, and that is, of course, Lola Pondering, St. Patrick's Day. And I'm delighted that St. Patrick's Festival Western Australia is going from strength to strength. Ganare Lowe. And I commend their committee for their, or as they would say in Ireland, the committee, uh, for their tireless dedication to this work. The success of the Irish community is measured not just through cultural scene. Today, I can tell you, and it is a function of our universities and our technological institutes, the largest number of people in the age group between 18 and 25 who finished with a degree in the 27 countries of the European Union are in fact Irish. And the largest number of people who go on from qualification to graduate level to research is in fact again in Ireland, closely followed by Malta. And I am glad that those whom I met last Sunday speak of the life they're having in Australia, the welcome they received, and the value that has placed on their contributions. So many generations of Irish people have across the centuries and the decades that now separate us from those early days in the Swan River colony and from Mr. Hackett, because so many 
come here to Western Australia now in search of a f better future for themselves and their families and in such different circumstances. But today, their contributions and legacies are still embedded deeply into the fabric of this state in its educational institutions. May our relationships with each other deepen. And this will happen in public services, in business and economic life, in the spaces of culture and leisure, as we visit each other more often, and in the thriving communities in which both of our peoples live. The Varshan is more than privately the main, the Mavan Kaila Saivin, Avenger, Litronona, Con an Irish in a Kilura, Shans, Omosahua, the winter Neheren, in Sha in Yerher Nasroya. As I visit as a president and as a head of state, I do so and think at that visit that my ancestors came here. And I hope and I acknowledge that they never came to a terra nullius. They came to a country that has contributed to the world a culture that is 65,000 years old, that is built on wisdom, that is built on symmetry, that is built on a relationship with nature which is now offering us new opportunities to reconsider moving our planet into a balanced relationship between ecology, economics, and ethics. And thus, what a healthy connection it is between this university and its community here in Perth. Again, may I say how you honour me and you honour Ireland by conferring me with this honorary degree of Doctor of Laws from a great university. I am deeply moved that I has, was invited earlier today to address the Parliament of Western Australia. Such an honour to be the first head of state to do so. I take that as a tribute to Ireland and to Irish people everywhere. This honour now, and that one earlier today to which I refer, I accept on behalf of all of the Irish, in all of the generations who came at home and abroad. I thank you from the depths of my heart, and I so wish you health and success, all of you, in the academic community of the University of Western Australia, all those who serve, and the community who supports you. Thank you so much. Paul